much integrated our programme. We were very pleased that she came and that others came, Godric and so on. So, uh, Ellison was at uh, Queen's University Belfast before she came here about three years, wasn't it, Ellison? Four, and yeah. Yeah. four? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. yeah. And before that, she was at Melbourne Uni. <clears throat> so, uh, without further ado, uh, Ellison's going to talk about From Bogeyman to Bison, a herd like amnesia of HIV, AIDS, and <laughs> you. Hi, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for putting out with the kind of technological debacle. That seems to be kind of the story of my life at the moment, but um, <laughs> we shall move on from it. Hopefully it will be fine. Um, so basically today I'm, I'm going to focus on um, the, the paper that the title alludes to, um, which is now a published article, so I sort of feel a bit weird reading it. It feels like um, it's done, but I'll try to frame it a little bit in terms of the bigger project. Um, so essentially at Queen's Uni in Belfast, um, and well, I'll go through and here, there was a particular reason why I decided to stage an Australian play, a play by um, a playwright from Sydney called Lock and Flipflop, and it was a play about gay male sexualities. Um, and in the end, so it's ended on a massive project which has produced two very different articles. The other article um, was called Translating Gay Time, um, and it's actually just come out this week in Australian Drama Studies, um, and that's very much a kind of cultural translation and questioning the idea of a global gayness um, uh, in that sense of, sort of queer critical geographers have really kind of questioned the idea of a global gay identity. Um, and so I was trying to show that the play being placed in Belfast, taking the Sydney play and placing it there, had kind of demonstrated that it, it was to do with space and place um, and that gay identity is not the same everywhere, even though there's a kind of homogenous image of the happy gay identity that we really get sold. So, um, uh, and I suppose the other thing to say is that Loughlin and I, the playwright, and I've been working together since 2000 when we actually did the initial um, and original version of this play in Melbourne. Um, and we've managed to somehow keep going with our kind of loose collaboration project or prods, um, which, as somebody in Northern Ireland pointed out to me, had quite a different connotation when it was put into the Catholic Protestant that we mixed there. <laughs> yeah. But so, um, uh, and you know, I think that that's quite um, an issue in terms of staging the play in Northern Ireland. So that was quite a key part of this, given that Northern Ireland is particularly sort of regional, rural, conservative, religious, um, vaguely troubled um, as well. So what happened was that there was a single catalyst that was the start of all of this, so the production and um, the two articles that emerged from it, and that is lovely <laughs> Iris. So I shall kick off. In June 2008, Iris Robinson MP, Democratic Unionist Party uh, member and wife of Northern Ireland's First Minister, um, caused controversy when she stated in a radio interview that homosexuality was an abomination that left her feeling physically nauseous. She extolled the virtues of the ex-gay mission as follows. I have a very lovely psychiatrist who works with me in my offices and his Christian background is he tries to help homosexuals trying to turn away from what they are engaged in. And I have met people who have turned around to become heterosexual. <laughs> so I start with Mrs. Robinson then because that's where the decision to stage Bison in Belfast started for me. And when she made those comments, there was a sort of massive galvanizing of the whole LGBTQ community. Um, and so I kind of wanted to, I was furious actually, was what happened. Um, and so I wanted to respond in some way. And the most obvious way for me was to make a theater production. Um, but because I was then newly ensconced in the university, and I suppose one thing that's interesting was that I grew up in Northern Ireland and I ran away essentially at 18, just went, oh, enough of that. Um, and, and it was so interesting to go back to Queen's and then go, oh, I'm in the middle of this, you know, the place of learning in Northern Ireland and I can do this. And so we had, um, had a one day conference that sat alongside the production then. So there was a program that I started a research and performance program called Queer at Queen's. So it was only waiting to happen, why nobody had done that? <laughs> but the Queer the Queens um, started off really with this and um, I think actually it was the first time in Ireland that we'd had a day looking at kind of queer identities in, in Northern Ireland. So uh, that was, I'd have to say that Queens would not put the full title of that conference up on the website at any point. Mm -hmm. With um, performing queer subjectivities and the word queer took quite a long time. Mm -hmm. and several emails, several phone calls, kind of definition of queer mm -hmm. theory. And um, here's Jim Robinson, far too political, that thing. <laughs> so, it was um, 
The sense of outrage that provoked me into being filled by play about contemporary gay male sexuality is to ulster a term I use in inverted commas, obviously, because it includes a whole set of social, historical, and political connotations connected to unionism and the zealously guarded integrity, and you know, we can read the integrity in any sort of corporeal way you want, of an evangelical Presbyterianism that has been marked historically by such campaigns as Ulster says no and save Ulster from sodomy. And that was Belfast Pride 2010. So, um, so I'll move on. So that's kind of the background really for where this has come from. Um, and I don't sound nearly as angry in this one as I did to begin with. Um, the other one actually I still do. So, um, back to this then. Um, in, in 2000, David Roman wrote an article, Not About AIDS, which was published in GLQ, a journal of lesbian and gay studies. And referencing two dance pieces, the article details the decline in representations of HIV, AIDS in performance, and a simultaneous move towards marriage and military as the twin foci of LGBT representation in the US. While the Don't Ask, Don't Tell is specific policy is specific to the US, the more transnational focus of LGBT rights organizations on marriage and the family over the past 15 years, certainly with regard to the UK, Australia, and um, the States, which I guess is the area I'm dealing with, can be seen to epitomize what Lisa Duggan has called the new homonormativity, and she describes that as a politics that does not contest dominant heteronormative assumptions and in institutions, but upholds and sustains them. As Julian Carter notes, most critiques of homonormativity draw attention to its relationship with neoliberal politics. For example, queer slash crit theorist Robert McRuer, whose work draws connections between queer theory and disability studies, uses the framework of neoliberalism to describe our contemporary moment as a normalizing historical period that insistently domesticates disruptive queer forces. The political strategy of normalizing gay, lesbian and gay life according to mainstream or heteronormative values is decidedly a move away from the queer strategies of the 1980s and early 1990s that, as Michael Warner has elucidated, set out to expose and challenge the institutions and discourses of heteronormativity precisely through what he calls resistances to the normal. Instead, an embrace of the homonormative results in what Warner identifies as a new hierarchy of good gays and bad queers, the former of which are notably white, monogamous, gender-conforming, and middle class. To this, I would add the able-bodied and healthy. Um, as a strategy, then, it includes the non-white, the financially dependent, the sick, the disabled, and those whose sexualities fall outside the framework of gay goodness. This hierarchy clearly has ramifications for which gay subjectivities are celebrated through representation and which are hidden away. Over the past decade since Roman's article, this normalization process has been reflected in mainstream media representation that aims to show, above all, how normal gays are. The most obvious examples include television's Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, The L Word, Ellen slash Ellen and her marriage to Portia de Rossi, and most recently the film The Kids Are All Right, and totally normal, by the way. <laughs> but the routinized visibility of the good gay lifestyle is problematic because, as Dana Collins argues, despite the intervention that positive images of marginalized subjectivities can make, she says liberatory and representational models still reproduce the key dichotomies of positive and negative representations, silenced and liberated sexualities, and <coughs> fantasy and real life. The emphasis on visibility implies that the reality of gay life is positive, or at least coherent enough to be represented, which presents a dilemma for those who intentionally use representation politically. The desire to challenge negative images of LGBT experience, therefore, brings with it a homogenizing and sanitizing visibility that seeks to hide away the bad gay life. So picking up from this context and set of queer theories, I argue that a dangerous but logical result of this um, fetish of normativity, to use Philip Harper's um, term, is the distancing of HIV AIDS from LGBT representation. Needless to say, HIV AIDS subjectivities are problematic for the project of homonormativity. While the strategy of breaking an assumed link between gay people and HIV AIDS has been vital and at times urgent, a byproduct created by what Cindy Patton has called the de-gaying of this is a diminished attention to the continued presence of HIV AIDS in the gay community. This lack of focus produces an amnesia which can be identified not only in representational practices but can, that can be seen to sideline or conveniently forget about HIV AIDS, but also in what Gregory Thompson argues has been a general decline in scholarly attention to HIV AIDS in humanities in general. 
Thompson insists that despite the apparent normalization of HIV AIDS in contemporary Western societies, the need for an invigorated response to the pandemic is grave. So while situated amongst a wide field of queer contestations of homonormativity, then this paper responds most directly to Roman's 2000 and Thomas's 2010 articles and focuses on two particular examples of HIV AIDS in theatre performance. The choice of performances emerges from an unexpected symmetry to my work as a director. Uh, one of the earliest jobs I had was as assistant director to avant-garde queer auteur Reza Abdo. Um, on his play Bookman at the Los Angeles Theatre Centre in 1991, and then recently by some for Belfast Ibris Queer Arts Festival in 2009 and the Oval House Theatre London in 2010. So despite very different dramaturgies, working methods and historical contexts, there is a thematic and political connection that unites the work as both plays respond to the occurrence and experience of HIV AIDS amongst gay men at their particular social moment. Yet while Abdo's play emerged at the height of AIDS activism, its representation on stage and the public discussion of this representation, Philpott's play goes against the brain by trying to reinsert HIV AIDS into what has been called the post-AIDS economy. Working from the material situations in which these productions took place, it's inevitably partial and personal. Its emphasis is on the US, Northern Ireland and Australia because that's where plays were produced or written. But from a somewhat elementary <coughs> starting point, the paper draws some parallels in the dramaturgy of the two pieces, despite their different contexts. Crucially, both locate their politics not in the dramatic dialogues of realism, often held up, certainly in British critical practices, as the epitome of political theatre, but in idiosyncratic queer dramaturgies that often work affectively rather than immediately cognitively. Through analysis of the affective and experiential impact of Abdo and Philpott's dramaturgical strategies, I argue ultimately that along with the continued need for the representation of HIV AIDS subjectivities on the contemporary Western stage, there needs to be a continual reimagining of a queer dramaturgy that can find forms to reflect the complexities of these subjectivities. There's a bit of a chronology that's going on then, and there's uh, a moment that is about AIDS that Boogeyman sits in. Um, and working on Boogeyman at LATC, the social context was one of paranoia and the labelling of HIV AIDS as gay play. Public advertisements at the time ranged from terrifying images of grim reapers and the suggestion that unsafe sex and this meant sex without a condom would almost certainly be lethal. And then it ranged to gay activist campaigns trying to counteract this hysterical homophobia that had emerged through this discourse. And now I'm going to what that is about because um, hopefully we will be able to um, look at this. Except I don't know how to do this. Australian um, campaign, I think it's from the late 80s, and it doesn't work. Doesn't want to work. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's going to work. Yeah. Um, and it's very, it, it, well, I won't preempt your reactions to it actually, but um, all I can say is that my partner and Lachlan are exactly the same age and they're very, thank you. Sorry. I remember this from Australia. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the British one. Yeah, the British one. The fact is, over 50,000 men, women, and children now carry the AIDS virus. And in three years, nearly 2,000 of us will be dead. <laughs> Stop it. If you have sex, have just one safe partner. 
God, I'm sorry it took so much nothing, but um, I think it's worth showing because um, we are, um, yeah, that's great, thanks. Um, you know, we're so influenced by those, and I think Sue, you sort of saying, oh, I remember this, um, and certainly that is the, you know, the environment that, that Lachlan, the playwright of Bison, remembers very, very clearly as, you know, and I remember the Grim Reaper type mm -hmm. bands, and certainly I remember being in Los Angeles in 1990, with huge billboards, you know, going to discriminate and, you know, massive campaigns having to deal with all this stuff. So that was, that was the environment and, and a lot of terror as well. Um, so the immediate context in the theatre was that Rosa was HIV positive, as was one of the cast. Um, and Bogeyman, I would say, was partly born out of Rosa's rage at his own HIV positive status, but also at the social and medical discursive construction of this disease as punishment on the immoral bad mm -hmm. gaze. Mm -hmm. Structured predominantly through fragmentation and montage, there is a multiplicity of overlapping narrative forces. Going through my rehearsal script, um, a messy, literally cut up and pasted, almost impossible to work my way through document, um, and given that I was the one probably trying to keep track of it, that doesn't go very well, does it? But, um, Res would come in every day with new bits of writing and change things, and, and so it, actually keeping track of the, the text was um, huge. Um, but going through it again, I, I you know, was seeing that narrative themes were really clear. The idea of being tested, the pervasion of illness, of pill popping, of corporal punishment by the state in a branding of butts, of committing suicide or trying to, and the dysfunctional all-American family really metonymically for the, um, the American state. Um, or states. This is nominally and tenuously held together by the plot of a terrorist, Hilda, Hilda's over there actually, played by Tom Carl, um, uh, who aims to blow up the Central Committee in response to their failure to provide dr drugs to his sick lover, Blake. However, the narrative strands are only one single element in terms of the dramaturgy. Experiencing it in the theatre, the piece was a massive, multi-layered technological juggernaut a 90-minute relentless visual and oral attack on the body and senses played at furious pace. Um, and I'll show you some of it. So it had a structure of five acts, a prologue and an epilogue set on Mars. Mm. An epilogue set on Mars. Staged with 11 actors and a cellist. It took place on a stage that required the main stage of the Los Angeles Theatre Centre to be ripped out to make room for a three-story tenement building with nine separate rooms, including one with working shower. And, um, Res used to pace around at the back of the auditorium, actually, just urging them, waving his arms frantically at the actors to go faster and faster. The day we moved onto the set and moved from, you know, this horizontal flat space of the rehearsal room and into this suddenly this three-story thing, he wanted them to go at full pace. And we had sort of one to the hospital that day, I think. So Julianne Francis, the one female performer um, in there, uh, and um, then Cliff as well ended up in the hospital. To Oh no, he's not the one hanging up. Oh, you mean he's the one hanging up? So down in there. I said Tony Torn, Fiona and I were talking about Tony Torn the other day. Tony's up from the top there. Torturer. But frenetic, absolutely frenetic, and pace was everything. Um, and they were all mic'd and just barrage, barrage of noise, image. Um, there was a videographer and videos showed in that kind of central piece as well. So just tongues going on all at once. Daniel Mufson notes that in Abdo's stage work, and these pictures are from Daniel Mufson's book, um, Rosa Abdo, um, he notes that there's extensive use of horizontal or sequential montage and vertical or simultaneous montage. He explains the latter as scenes and actions that remain separated spatially yet comment on one another in their simultaneity. While he equates verticality with simultaneity, this verticality clearly was realized um, literally as well in the extravagance of Bogeyman's set. Its density, dizzying speed, and deafening volume produced an overwhelming affected intensity. Despite the apparent counterintuitiveness of this, it's the density and experiential in uh, intensity that makes Abdo's work so, political, so politically effective, I think. While critics complain of overload to the point of meaningless, for example, Michael Feingold on typewrite white, none of it makes sense, and the absence of any context from Abdo's work is its most alarming uh, element. Uh, it is precisely Abdo's experiential or affective dramaturgy that is crucial to its social political efficacy in intervening in discourses of HIV, AIDS, or in tight right writing about racism. As I've argued in terms of Sarah Kane's late work, 
An effective dramaturgy relies more on what theatre feels like than what it signifies on a cognitive level, certainly immediately, and is committed to producing its own play world rather than sitting in a referential and implicitly inferior position to a world outside. As Sylvie Drake notes in her review of Minamata, this event is to be experienced. It compels attention by hurling images and signs at its audience like an automatic tennis server on dessert. <laughs> Late motifs, counterpoint, and eclecticism are keys to Abba's staggering creation. It is not without meaning ultimately, but that meaning may not immediately be obvious during the experience of the performance, where various strategies, in his case, well, as I said, multiplicity of narrative sound and visuals, point of overload, work to resist an easy interpretation. As affect theorist Brian Masumi has argued, however, it is the strength or what he calls the intensity of the image, let's say the non-signifying image, that ultimately affects how meaning is made. The embodied affective impact does not remain outside of the signification loop, but eventually becomes meaningful as the mind consciously qualifies, and that's Masumi's word, the mind qualifies the effect of the image retrospectively in what he calls a backward referral in time. Thus, while reviews and analysis of this work highlight the sensory overload, the most astute recognise that he has not set out to obfuscate or make a meaningless theatre, but one that works in a particular way to make its meaning. So as Drake continues, it's only on second viewing that the show's beauty, communicated by osmosis rather than apprehension, begins to set in. In time, it's the sum of the disparate part that works, disparate parts that works. In time, we realise that our own frustrations notwithstanding, this is a breakthrough for the artist. Drake's repetition of the qualifier in time conveys Masumi's backward referral and time at work on the spectator. The immediate impact takes on meaning as it is processed ceremonially after the event. I've cut a large example here because we haven't got time. Um, but um, I, I have an example in the article about um, how he staged a monologue and, and, and used sort of a whole tap dancing chorus line to punctuate it along with the live cello punctuating it along with, you know, buttle surface leg and, you know, ear crunching volume and all the rest of it. And then there's moments of stillness and silence that came out of that. Um, so Abdus is a, a dramaturgy of repetition, juxtaposition, acceleration, simultaneity, and above all, accumulation, layer upon layer of text, music, sound effect, gesture, dance, all adding up to a series of effective climaxes. Above all, when I look at the script now, I can still hear the way actors delivered certain lines and how the punctuation of the cello or the tension building of the recorded music was used to create a nervousness in the body and a sense that the whole theatre would explode along with Hilda's bomb. In this way, the composition of the performance text works on the spectator far beyond the reach of the signifying qualities of the spoken text. And it is this that allows Abdo and both man to respond to HIV AIDS and its discourses in a dramaturgy that, while it may not be instantly recognisable as political theatre, Nicolas Marichaud would describe as theatre done in a political way, by questioning the frame, questioning theatre as such. John Bell argues that the arrival of AIDS produced a move away from an American postmodern theatre that had been politically disengaged since the end of the Vietnam War. The AIDS epidemic changed the nature of avant-garde performance irrevocably, he says, forcing artists to consider and analyse not only the horror of the killing disease, but the social and political implications of government and corporate responses to the epidemic, as well as questions of homophobia and racism inevitably linked with the AIDS crisis. Roman concurs, arguing that the driving force behind performances and plays by AIDS may be neither rage nor remembrance, as some critics argue, but the attempt to intervene in a dominant AIDS ideology as it takes shape and is sustained instead. In fact, there was definitely rage driving Abdo's work, a point made repeatedly in reviews and critical analyses, but he himself notes that anger acts as an agent that propels you to take action. Abdo channeled his rage to do exactly what Tomso is calling for now, to produce a cultural riposte to the hegemonic discourse of the base that prevailed at that point in time. Thus, Bell posits Abdo's work as a brilliant theatrical response to what Simon Watney has called the spectacle of AIDS. Watney's argument was that this didactic spectacle, performed through the European and North American mass media and AIDS education, expunged the diseased bodies of gay men in order to shore up the patriarchal family. In this analysis, the diseased gay body is seen not only to threaten other normative bodies, but also metaphorically threaten state, family, and society. Abdo's post-HIV positive plays resolutely staged the diseased gay body, using his queer dramaturgy to tackle neoliberal discourse of AIDS governance. The dramaturgy is queer rather than gay because it moves from an identity politics of representation to a resistance um, to dominant theatrical notions of character and plot development that tend to fix visions 
and that's Selena Busby and um, oh, uh, Central Steve Farrier's um, article. As Gautam does Gautam notes, Abdo is not one to search after fixed identities. Rather, the open and fluid form resists both normative dramaturgical frameworks and normative discourses of ideology and power. In his experiential queer dramaturgy, Abdo staged gay HIV AIDS subjectivities without normalizing, without degaying, and without apology. I know this is a ridiculous picture. Why well, couldn't find one with eyes from man who just superimposed himself? I don't know. Anyway, Roman argues that the discourses of the late 1980s and early 1990s, resolutely about AIDS, gave way to what was called the end of AIDS discourse. Emerging from medical advances in the treatment of HIV AIDS, this discourse produced an understanding of AIDS as a manageable condition rather than a terminal one. These advances in turn produced a lack of media interest in AIDS and calls from gay figures for post-AIDS identities and cultures. This is a highly problematic position, firstly because a scholarship dealing with the discursive construction of the end of AIDS has shown it's ensconced in issues of race, class and access. Secondly, as noted, it has produced a cultural climate in both mainstream and LGBT media that has to a very large extent occluded HIV AIDS from public discourse and representation beyond discussion of HIV and AIDS in other countries, you know the other countries. Um, Roman argues the social, cultural and medical problems that structure this moment in AIDS history have been rendered invisible by this discourse. This invisibility is supported by the gay and lesbian media which have positioned marriage in the military as the two main political sites of the late 1990s at the expense of AIDS. As noted, this focus on, is predicated on producing desirable post-AIDS identities through the strategy of distancing gay subjectivity from AIDS and anything that marks the LGBT community as non-normative and unhealthy. Duggan notes that alongside radical and progressive AIDS activism, a new strain of gay moralism appeared, attacks on promiscuity and the gay lifestyle, accompanied advocacy of monogamous marriage as a responsible disease prevention strategy. Taking Patton's term, de-gaying beyond the context of mid-1980s AIDS education's attempts to reduce the homophobia surrounding AIDS, the longer term result, arguably, has been an LGBT community that has de-gayed itself. Reading Roman alongside Tomso, it's sobering to realize that in the decades since the former wrote his piece, and the almost two decades since Bogeyman, the normalizing focus on marriage and family appears to have increased if anything. As Philpott puts it in Bison, Things are different now gays gone mainstream. Gays on Big Brother, sitcoms and shit. Rainbow flags everywhere. People like gays. Gays are funny. <laughs> At the same time, the undesirable gay HIV AIDS subjectivity has been ushered away of sight along with the other bad queers. In terms of AIDS discourses and governance, this is evidence of what Thompson formulates as a new wave of conservative backlash against those infected with HIV. A neoliberal uh, exhortation to take personal responsibility in managing one's HIV serious status now competes with older public health approaches that look to the state rather than to the individual to stem the tide of the pandemic. That was Thompson. Roman argues for the continued need for AIDS performance while acknowledging that this is problematic if contemporary culture is not about AIDS. If this was true in 2000, it is, as Thompson argues, as pressing now when it is clear that in very real terms, According to HIV AIDS statistics, uh, contemporary Western society is still about AIDS, but apparently only one day a year when we get some new kind of updates about what we're at, and last week's were no different, it's getting worse, and the numbers are rising in Western societies. So um, according to the Avert website, and this was last year, um, oh, 2010, imagine, um, there is mighty evidence that prevention activities in several high-income countries are not keeping pace with the spread of HIV, and in some places are falling behind. Roman notes Michelangelo Signorino's warning that we are headed towards an unqualified disaster in which a new generation of gay men become as immersed in the horrors of AIDS, disease, and death as previous generations. A disaster Roman puts down to the message and belief that AIDS is over. This new generation is also identified by anthropologist Benjamin Jung, who outlines three generations of gay men. So firstly, those who watched their peers die and subsequently have been processing the idea that they survived despite years of sexual activity without HIV zero conversion. A second cohort who came of age subsequent to the installation of safer sex as the guiding principle of HIV prevention and to whom condoms were normative, and I'd say the ones that saw the vans um, are probably my generation and all of us. Um, and finally, emerging in the mid-1990s, a third cohort of young gay men who had little or no personal experience with AIDS. 
It's this third generation and the one that will follow it that is clearly most at risk from the cultural absence of HIV AIDS representation. Current statistics indicate that in recent years there's been a significant increase in new infections among men who have sex with men, MSM, in higher income countries. Johnson notes that the failure of current prevention activities can be traced to what he calls the obvious limit of the one-size-fits-all HIV prevention mantra use a condom every time. He says the supposedly rational subject of HIV prevention who dutifully and routinely adheres to safe sex practices after learning the roots of HIV transmission has not fully materialized. Successful treatments have raised new ethical and epidemiological questions and the very act of survival in the midst of the pandemic has led to new sexual identities such as fair factors, um, new valuations of life and health and new modes of subjectivity. This vastly more complex understanding of gay HIV AIDS subjectivity is difficult but vital for contemporary performance to engage with and requires a new fearlessness in resisting the urge to present yet more easily consumed funny prick gays. Indeed, there's still a deliberate resistance to dealing with it in new gay plays, as this article in the New York Times from last year attests, and they wrote, a new breed of plays and musicals this season is presenting gay characters in love stories, replacing the direct political messages of 1980s and 90s shows like The Normal Heart and Angels in America with more personal appeals for social progress. The combination of a desire to normalize gay life and rightly to move AIDS discourse away from the gay disease to a universal pandemic has produced a mainstream slash gay stream cultural output which is reluctant to reflect the plurality of emerging gay and sexualities. Evidence of increasing engagement in unsafe sex habits and contemporary theorizations of the complexities of economies of pleasure and risk mark a new moment that demands precisely a more directly political representation of embodied gay life that refuses to conform to the myth that we in the West are indeed post-AIDS. Bringing this argument to the UK, um, while some performance artists have insistently kept HIV AIDS on the agenda in non-mainstream venues such as David Hoyle at the Royal um, Vauxhall Tavern, for example, in London, in a non-urban conservative environment such as Northern Ireland, this type of subcultural performance is extremely rare, compounding a lack of mainstream or even fringe theatre representation of gay subjectivities of any kind. In 2007, the Art Risk Queer Arts Festival in Belfast was established precisely in response to this absence, not only in theatre but across the arts. Deciding to stage Phil Potts Vice in, in Northern Ireland then um, was a direct response to the absence of a plurality of gay subjectivities on the Northern Irish stage and made more urgent on this by Robinson's homophobic comments. Less publicly sensational, but what became clear while working on the play is that there has been a political failure of the power sharing executive of the devolved legislature of Northern Ireland to deal with the issue of HIV AIDS. They just hate talking about it, so they just don't. While the latest statistics from the Public Health Agency document that the number of people in Northern Ireland living with HIV has quadrupled over the past decade, there has been little public discussion of HIV AIDS, whether in political, social or cultural fields. The statistics on homophobia also illustrate Northern Irish conservatism powerfully, with 23% of people confirming in a 2008 poll for the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland that they would have a problem with a gay, lesbian or bisexual person. So this context was backdrop for the Belfast production of Bison, and it's fair to say as I pointed out that range of playing part. Um, I directed Bison with a playwright in its first incarnation in 2000, and true to Romans, and this is a picture from Melbourne actually, um, true to Romans' chronology of AIDS discourses, the first version was definitely not about AIDS. Autobiographical and written in the wake of the end of Philpott's first serious relationship, it conveyed a highly personal experience of the anonymity of gay male sex and the desire for love and fulfillment. <coughs> The original version of Bison engaged poignantly and humorously with the herd-like repetitions and patterns of gay male experience by way of a central protagonist's attempts to negotiate this and no characters were named in it. Um, there was um, an S and then one to six and they fluidly moved around. Um, but um, it, I, I would say it didn't come straight to any overtly political stance at that point. It was very personal, very um, abstract kind of drama. However, when Locke came to rewrite the play for 2009, he noted five major areas he wanted to explore, given the changes he perceived in gay lifestyle over the decade, and those were the racism and the ageism of the subculture, the shift imposed by technology and virtual sex, the culture of not committing, the generic nature of the global gay scene, and most prominently, the forgetting that has occurred about HIV. 
Um, so in an email conversation that we were having, he said, out of sight, out of mind, it seems, and so everyone goes and talks fair back and thinks it's okay. My feeling is that it is like some huge unspoken suicide mission of the next generation because common sense has been thrown aside for a hedonistic lifestyle and the assumption that PEP will save them. And if that doesn't work, it hardly matters anyway because nobody gets under lesions and dies from it. Like, anyway, he doesn't really use any more punctuation in his plays, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's pretty um, clear about his stance on this. Um, Echoing senior relay, Philpot is adamant that amongst the younger gay demographic, HIV AIDS is regarded with a dangerous collective amnesia that runs counter to the actual rates of HIV infection in Western society. The figure of young, newly out Jason uh, in the play personifies this forgetfulness when, in a conversational exchange with an older man, as one reviewer put it, he samples the word AIDS like he's trying to recollect some fact from his history GCSE exam. <laughs> The current script of Bison attempts to represent the complex subjectivities Thompson delineates in terms of unsafe sex, risk, and pleasure, while not underestimating that there are whole sets of problems to do with identifying, representing, and treating human subjects of HIV AIDS. This is addressed through Philpott's complex non-linear dramaturgy that, although aesthetically very different from Abdo's, shares a clear resistance to fixing identity. Thus, while there are four named characters in this version, each embodied by a different member of the cast, and who do sometimes have straightforward dialogue with another character or deliver monologues in that role. The performers spend more time functioning as a chorus, whereas other figures who populate this gay time or verbally describing the scene unfolding in what I've called um, Philpott's scene setting voice and uses sort of a narrative voice quite frequently as a device. Yes. No, no, he does. It's, it's very much part of his, um, uh, his song, his way of creating theatre. And they will complain about it. So lots of dramatists complain that you know you have to show. The theatre is all about showing, not telling. Mm -hmm. And it does create some difficulties when you've got something explained, you can't show it. But, um, but I think it works very, very well. Um, this plurality and fluidity of roles resists mainstream attempts to re fix and render transparent the identity of the person with HIV AIDS. Aesthetically, rather than simultaneity and assault of overload, Philpott's emphasis falls on the effective impact of the materiality of language and his strength is in the orchestration of voices and wordplay. In staging, this linguistic corporeality tests the materiality of the stage, forcing the creation of an open, unfixed space that can move with the same fluidity and pace as the spoken words. Described scenes do not need to be duplicated visually. What they do need is to appear and disappear in an instant with a change of light or a particular placement on stage or a gesture or something to indicate that suddenly we're somewhere new, but the language is doing that for us really mostly anyway. Within this label structure, Thompson's call for a renewed attention to sexual subjectivity vis-a-vis HIV AIDS is embodied in the figure of Simon. And despite Phil Pott's clear personal frustration at practices of unsafe sex, coming as he does from that middle generation, he creates in Simon a complex picture of gay male sexual desire and subjectivity. This is conveyed <clears throat> in the imagery of Simon walking a metaphorical tightrope of unsafe sex in a corner land circus of gay porn and ready sex. Um, so it's a moment when it's sort of this very barren star stage suddenly goes all pink and you know glittery and becomes this lovely tightrope type thing and you have to find some sort of physicality to, to, to do that. Um, <coughs> I've cut this text as well, but hopefully we'll get a sense of it. So sometimes, so you'll see X up here for Simon in this case, but quite often that is one. So the actor playing X is, is number one. So Simon says, let's go somewhere, three, where? Somewhere we can go a bit further. You know what I want to do? You pause. It's showtime in the big top. You pause, right? A syringe and a mask, a hose and a slap. Pause, are you? A big wide smile like an animal trap. Yeah. Um, and so, what I'd argue with this is that um, we see the complicated structure of Philpott's dramaturgy. On one level, there's the dialogue in real time between two men, S and three. However, this is intercut with voices two and four narrating both Simon's internal desire and kind of confusion and setting up the imaginary scene using the metaphor of the tightrope walker and the corner line circus that's been set up. And I think this creates a dramaturgy of suspension or delay. It sort of stalls moment and stretches them out. Effectively, this moment <coughs> works in performance by building up layers of voice through overlapping and chorus, 
supported by visual and sonic realization of the metaphor with lighting, sound, and movement. As with Aldra's work, this resists the more clearly emotional or empathetic device of a realist dialogue, the usual dramaturgical architecture of political theatre. Like Abdo's, the politics is in the experience of that moment in the theatre. Uh, Simon's monologue is the most confronting scene in the play, dealing with his desires for violent whiskey sex and his disregard for the consequences of this sex. I put it up, but I wasn't going to read it because I think we're a bit short of time. Well, actually, I'm finished. Shall I read it? Mm -hmm. I'll read the end, I'll read the beginning. Close your time. Things crashing, but I don't feel them. Things crashing, but when they smash, I can't feel them hit my skin. The blood looks pretty as it drips in a puddle on the floor below. And finally, I make you pull it out and stand up dizzy. That puddle of blood, pretty as if it's what? That blood dripping from inside me. What? As if it's what? This is as far as we've gone, but we keep going. And so it goes on in this thing. Um, um, so perhaps uh, I think in Simon this sexual subjectivity makes such an impact in performance because in portraying a desire for dangerous sex, Simon embodies on stage the lack of rationality that Tom Foote indicates in the complexity of identifying a single universal age and the age subjectivity. It raises questions in individual spectators about moral judgments and ethical concerns, placing the ideologies of public discourses of HIV AIDS, governance into stark relief. It highlights the very potent and ambivalent feelings about personal responsibility both the playwright and I, and I assume members of the audience, share. Simon's long graphic monologue also exemplifies Thompson's insistence on being heard as we express our ongoing struggles with loss and survival, even if, especially if, what we have to say strikes others as repugnant or distasteful. Simon and in different ways the other figures in Bison do not fill the neoliberal profile or reproduce representations of a desirable, commercially viable game. In a period when homonormativity is inscribed as a liberatory strategy, Philpott critiques notions of an homogenous, unitary gay male sexuality slash subjectivity, and offers ultimately a queer world in which the subjectivity stated are imperfect, multiple, conflicted, and endlessly shifting. As in, sta as in outdoor stage world, HIV AIDS is part of gay experience, and the play insists that we do not separate the two. So, if in the moment of Bogeyman, Abdo refused to de-gay HIV AIDS, with Bison, perhaps Philpott re-gays HIV AIDS discourses by suggesting to contemporary audiences that HIV AIDS is not separate from gay experience, no matter how necessary it's once been to provide this separation. Philpott assumes that theatre can provoke a more complex discussion than the whiting out of sexual subjectivities that fall outside of the hetero normative matrix, and in doing so responds to Tom Cleave for new cultural provocations in a post-post-AIDS economy. Not to do so is to be complicit in creating another generation living the lie that AIDS is history. If he struggles with the younger generation's forgetfulness of HIV AIDS and its legacies, Phil Potts' queer dramaturgical strategies, like Abdo's, ensure that he does not offer solutions in the form of an idealized, fixed, in both senses, gay masculinity. While it seems somewhat contradictory to want to raise awareness of the presence and dangers of HIV AIDS and yet state ambiguous sexual subjectivities, it's imperative to avoid the same old representational economies of good gays and bad queers. Philpott's updated version of Bison is angrier, more clearly political in thrust, yet retains the elliptical and fluid style that is as much part of it doing theatre in a political way as Abdo's assault of dramaturgy. With his own queer dramaturgy, Philpott is able to reignite Abdo's cause and bring an unsettling but, also, but urgently timely reimagining of gay subjectivities onto the stage. So I finished the excerpt. Just I will add a little postscript, which is that um, since this, there has been a fabulous new play in <laughs> called *The Year of Magical Monkey* um, by Neil Watkins, and um, he's an HIV-positive performer. Uh, it's a one-man show, Italian and um, verse. Uh, quite amazing um, piece of staging, and so probably that's where I'd like to go next with this. It's right about it, mm. but probably also alongside um, Pete Edwards' piece Fat. Um, and Pete Edwards is a, um, a gay man with cerebral palsy, and it's very interesting to see what happens when you bring that to a queer arts festival and watch the lovely gay men run in droves from it. <laughs> and don't want to know, um, and so probably using a queer script theory and. Um, and Margaret Childrick's idea of um, um, like the contingent, contingently able-bodied yeah. um, and contingent able-bodiedness 
and read those together. And then after that, I'm going to write about women. <laughs> <laughs> But I read that he does it all the time. So, um, so there is a copy, but God knows what it would be, you know, what it would be now. Mm. And it's interesting because we were working on that at the same time as we were doing the um, production in Northern Ireland. And um, the other art was all about this process of transcultural translation. And you have all these issues of, right, well, we'll take out all the Australian bits. So all the, you know, <laughs> the, um, the gum trees and the biting ants mm -hmm. and all that go and the, you know, blazing hot sun. Actually, I've got a great picture of um, the sort of, the scene of Mardi Gras in Sydney, you oh, know, yeah. it's hot, sweaty, and all the language, you know, all this hot, sweaty boys in it, you know, all the sweat and everything, and like, you're doing it in November in Northern Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay. So there's the kind of those geographical and um, linguistic and meteorological flora and fauna things that you're changing. But you're also whether if you put Northern Irish ones in, is that going to end up in this script and become something kind of weird? So it was a funny. Sorry, that was a very long answer to that question. <laughs> Not in library yet, but we'll get to it. <laughs> um, how did the production? How was how was it received in Northern Ireland? Mm. Well, that's really what um, I deal with more in that other article because, in fact, what I'm marking, and it was only a tiny. Um, you know, it was a studio, well, it was a lovely production until afterwards, and I realised people talked about it a lot, and it had been quite an important thing. Um, and partly that was because they were excited about the different kind of form of it, but partly they were really excited about what it was saying and what it was asking them to think about. But I realised after we went to the Oval House that, of course, at the Oval House, it was just full of men. It was full of men who were all actually the same demographic as um, Richard, the older figure in the play. So lots and lots of 40-year-old um, men. And um, Sweet McCarthy, who's the artistic director of the First Career Arts Festival, who came over to do a post show discussion at the Oval House on Career Theatre in Northern Ireland. And she pointed out, you know, why would lesbians go and see Bison in London? But in Northern Ireland, of course, they did, lesbians and um, lots of straight women as well. And also, you had, it was a cast of four gay men, <coughs> Northern Irish gay men, who were really performing to their peers and mm. partners, mm. lovers and friends. and. And that, that meant something, actually. Mm. It really did make a difference. And so it, it was quite, it, it did make an impact, I think. I think it has had some sort of um, kind of lasting thing there. In a way that, um, I mean, it went very well at the other house, you know, it did all those things, just sort of like whatever, but in the same way, it's not going to sit, I think, making the same splash as it did. And when I say that, it made a splash, like, you know, it's, that work doesn't get lots of reviewers, and there is no great reviewing, um, there's very little reviewing going on theatre work in Northern Ireland. There's so little theatre work going on anyway. I mean, and I've pointed out, like, if gay men are having a bad time, there are no lesbians at all. Mm -hmm. so, and I know they've tried to program them at like, <coughs> Queen's, and we just ended up with solo men all the time. Um, and so, hence my desire to actually really try to shift my focus on to women. But, but I think um, it was very different. It was a specific moment, and I think it was to do with the Iris Robinson. People just wanted something that was, certainly the whole Queer Arts Festival was very, very important. Yeah. It was really, um, you know, it was an event, it's always an event, it's massive because, you know, it's like one week, week of the year, it gets all exciting and gay. Um, and then, so anything that's kind of touching in and tapping in on things is, is, you know, really well received. Of course, 
first Irish woman tsunami, and that, that developed into something else completely, didn't it? Oh, Eventually, yeah. I can you imagine? Oh, it was great. Right. Oh, it was great. <laughs> you know, it's just that yeah. kind of delight of realising the whole thing is so shambolic and such a sham. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, so this might be slightly complicated, but I think the um, so it, um, the, it, the idea of an affective dramaturgy yeah. set against um, a sort of politics that is framed discursively, I think is that yeah. fair to say, yeah. um, w was interesting, but I wondered about the, the, the strange, bi I, I felt there was a binary being set up then mm. between um, when we had the, the poli political scene of certain signifiers like the Grim Reaper mm -hmm. being repeated over and over again and constructing a certain situation for in which this affect of dramaturgy would then intervene. Um, and then I think you brought up the word discursive and d discourse you know, quite a few times and, and just going back to Foucault and the use of signifiers and creating a, a, a discourse. Um, and the affect of dramaturgy would seem to be the thing that challenged that the, the idea where it was where signification met, mattered less than the feeling and the experience. So I wanted, but I, I suppose I wondered about the, the there was a poss possible binary between you know a, a queer dramaturgy that felt and a heteronormative dramaturgy that thought. And I yeah. and I wondered if you could also conceptualize you know the politics that happens that is being challenged in terms of affect. Equally. Over what kind of affects are being produced by that discourse? Oh, which discourse? The um, Grim Reaper. The oh, right, okay. Or um, I mean, I suppose, I mean, in this paper, I'm showing the Grim Reaper. It doesn't come up. Um, it's not how I'm theorizing the a dramaturgical kind of set of strategies. Um, I think I'm missing. I think I'm missing something here because certainly, you know, that side of it, that's me afterwards theorizing and looking back at a play that you know happened 20 years ago and trying to figure out now why it took me 20 years to to get the vocabulary to write about it. Why at the time, you know, yeah. I could I couldn't. All I knew was that I sat in the theatre just going, oh my god, this is amazing. Theatre can work like this. I suppose what I'm, I, I'm yeah. saying is, am I misreading it and thinking that queer dramaturgy it feels and, and heteronormative strategies of, of govern, government and policy think? Is that, or is, you know, signification versus affect, is that the binary being set up or does politics also work effectively? Uh, politics definitely works effectively. Yeah. I mean, my great example is Reagan, that mm -hmm. Reagan never said a word of sense, but in fact, effectively, everybody just mm -hmm. loved him and loved yeah, him. Yeah. And, you know, and that's one of his. So politics absolutely works for you, but, but okay. perhaps that it could work on both an affect and also a rational as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Politics would only could touch itself. Yeah, either. absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I think it does sound in here that I'm creating a binary, but I would go back to probably my favourite piece of writing <coughs> about, um, about effect, and that was the writing by Jeremy Gilbert, who's a cultural theorist that writes yeah. a lot about musicology. And, um, you know, his um, article was really what kind of got me figuring out, because he talks about an effective analysis. But in the same way as Bert State's binocular vision says, you know, you've got these two sides working always together, the significant mm -hmm. and the, and mm -hmm. the phenomenological. Um, in the same way Gilbert was saying, look, um, affects always work within a signifying yeah. realm. They always work within a material topic. So I think I've got enough. Yeah. The context is absolutely vital. So when I write about Robinson and about the things that are going on there and those kind of political signifiers and the language that's being used or the language that's not being used in, in the assembly in Northern Ireland, the, the absences and all those sorts of things. Those are absolutely material signifying kind of context that that takes place within. I guess my argument would be that um, we've got lots of ways of responding to that mm. context. And one of them is performance and within that choice we can absolutely create plays which um, absolutely articulate mm. those mm. arguments and can do so brilliantly. And um, there was a play in Northern Ireland that did do that sort of the year after as well. 
But again, I'd say much more mainstream. It was in the Belfast Festival. Yeah. And it was very much, I think, for a straight audience, kind of, you know, mm. the figure of a woman who has a son's game, and blah, 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 mm. and all this sort of stuff. And I would argue that that works in one way, and it does something. But that these plays particularly choose to do something and make that argument differently. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I should say is that it's not that one is better or that one mm -hmm. is um, one rules out the legitimacy of another. Um, and if it sounds like that, you know, probably it, it does sound like that because that it would be my preference. You know, aesthetically, it would be my preference. But there's more to it than just individual preference, it's the fact that we are so bad at writing about affect and about mm. phenomenological experience or performance that in fact we've still got a long way to call back. And so for example, you know, my whole thesis about Kane was to argue that she's been so written off as not political, mm. as apolitical because mm. the plays don't, you know, have a context and they don't have a this they don't mm. work in this proper way that theatre meant to do. We all know that whole kind of um, discourse around that. And so my my work was to kind of try to figure out um, how does theatre can work politically? And that was where Masumi became yeah. very useful for me because I could say, absolutely, it's not removing itself from a political context. It's not disavowing itself of what's going on outside socially. Um, and so for me, this sort of fits in the same argument, which is that these are not plays that are divesting themselves of a, a highly signified social context, but they are responding in a very particular idiosyncratic way. Just leading on to that, since you talk about assuming, could you just expand on this notion that you're talking about backward referral in time mm -hmm. and how you were using it in this context? Yeah, sure. He gives an example of that. Um, it's a brilliant example. I haven't read this for a while. He, his example was that there were all these school children and they were shown a video of a snowman melting. And they were shown different versions of it, one with sound, one with different stuff going on, with some more heightened emotions and some with less. And they were all wired up and everything. And out of that experiment, he basically um, extrapolated this idea that um, the intensity of the moment, so whatever kind of image or feeling that we're having at that moment, and it may not be as far as an emotion that he separates the mind, and emotion is a sort of personalized, recognized, we identify all the rest of it, affect he would describe as a pre-personal move, movement within us, and a pre-personal intensity. And so he worked at the that experience of that intensity doesn't just fly off into the ether afterwards. That in fact what happens is that out of a whole range, he describes it as out of a whole range of possibilities, the mind consciously qualifies something mm -hmm. and will make some sense of it. And how I think that an effective dramaturgy works differently from others is that certainly when I did pain, for example, and my thesis was about how we direct this to, to try to open up, to, to not make all the choices happen on stage and place all the emotion on stage, but to leave it for the audience somehow. Um, that was very much about trying to make these dramaturgical decisions that, that left an intensity rather than placing an emotion that was already that was already belonging to a character on right. stage. And so that you would so I mean really it was from Sue Ellen Case that this beautiful analysis of um, four forty eight arguing against a sort of character or logical or biographical or narratological approach and look for but actually saying that the play world was the thing that was sick and so I tried to really kind of create this world that was not about um, a single woman playwright slash Sarah Kane slash hysterical woman who was, you know, psychotic and all the rest of it, but a play world which was in mm. not the logic that we're used to that doesn't work quite the way we're used to and then it's left outside to the audience to figure it out. And if they experience that moment somehow, even if in the moment of experiencing it's not quite clear, so there's mm. lots of scenes in, in 448, for example, that you know could be a lot of different things. It's trying to keep them as possibly a lot of different things rather than limiting them. We were talking yesterday in the MA class, you know, there was a production where there's a scene that supposedly ECT, it's all these loud words, flash flicker, you know, punch grab, whatever. They strapped the young woman because where she's a woman onto the table and then lots and lots of like big noise, like electric noise. And in questionnaires I did after that show and my own production is the same questionnaire, you know, people would identify that <coughs> moment as standing out because it had been created as the big dramatic moment. And yet there's this lovely director in Melbourne called William Hens and he did a great production of Craig Inter oh, it's going to be recorded a lot of intercut with Beckett. And um, he um, he said everything about Cain is set up to avoid the big dramatic moment. Mm -hmm. 
it's all there, but it's about reading, trying to find the materiality of the language, or mm. something which produces either it's um, the intensity of either coming through a visual image or through a sonic image, or whatever it is, a feeling, that then you have to go and do the work yourself and clog by it, and it becomes emotion, or it becomes a cerebral kind of cognitive process. Yeah. So, um, the, for me, kind of looking back, you know, so, um, you know, seeing plays, you know, from kind of the early eighties, you know, when, you know, when, when um, things first started happening, and start talking about, and that what you were saying about, you know, doing the work, you know, seeing that work twenty years ago, mm -hmm. and not really being able to kind of articulate what you're yeah. seeing. I think it's also, isn't it, it's about that what we had in the early 80s onwards was a kind of new aesthetic as yeah. well, an aesthetic of, of, of disease. Yeah. And, and with that came lots of different sorts of metaphors and lots of different sorts of imagery that hadn't really been sort of um, presented before. So I think also there was there was a lot of stuff that, that was very, um, if you like, mainstream and traditional and, this, and very, you know, like the normal heart, for instance, mm -hmm. it, it is, is, is something that comes to mind. But there, there was also lots of things that were just trying to find a way of expressing yeah. an atmosphere or expressing an emotion or, or presenting um, notions of illness or fear of illness that, that hadn't really been... They haven't really happened before. Yeah, actually, you know, it's really funny now because I haven't ever made this link. But um, when you read about where Kane talks about she wants to make this experiential theatre, mm -hmm. the thing, one of the things that comes up is this performance sick that is, um, you know, where this um, performance company had played this noise over and over so that eventually the audience was feeling yes. sick. Yeah, yeah, and and that was, you know, mm -hmm. and there was, or whether it was in it was in um, Mad, the production of Mad. Where she had a monologue called Sick, and, and it was mad, but I think that in Mad they tried to do that as well. So I'm just kind of thinking that that mm -hmm. sick thing with her, that, that early monologue of Sick, um, was already maybe kind of um, trying to think about that different experience. And again, it's that different experience of life and how you show the experience as opposed to talking about it. I mean, I can remember some of the criticisms of, of the, the ancients in America, the early criticisms were about, you know, the kind of know, it's kind of accused of, I suppose, what we, you know, say that, you know, the, the, the kind of theatricality yeah. of some of the imagery, but actually what, what was being, what was being explored there was the kind of, the, the, what, what drugs do to you yeah. in that, in that kind of heightened state. So it was in, it was, it was kind of new ground being broken in that way of trying to, so I think that's why, yeah. looking back, you can kind of see that now, but at the time it was hard to kind of know how to think about it because we, we didn't have the language. Yeah, and I think we're still quite that. I think we still mm -hmm. actually are limited in our in how we talk about in our performance analysis. Mm -hmm. I think we're still quite limited. Although I did have a fight with um, Mary Lockhurst with that at a drum teacher's conference when I said that um, she thinks that we do, but um, but I, I would stand by the idea that I think we're still developing our ways mm -hmm. of talking business because more and more I think are surfacing lots of different kind of whether you call it a phenomenological school or a, an, an affect school, certainly queer performance, I mean, things of Munoz, and there's different people trying to write about affect in performance. Yeah. I was just thinking um, about where, for me, people at least like this at Abdo came out of. Yeah. Because, um, yes, on one, on one hand, it was a new language, but for me, it came out of people like on one hand, Richard Foreman, and that yeah. completely irrational theatre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, people like Karen Finley, yeah. who didn't tell so much as, well, now she tells, but at, in, yeah. in those days, she just became inhabited by rage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was just a kind of, um, it wasn't so much the content of what she was saying, it's just watching this personal experience. Um, and kind of those two, I, I think he's an, an interesting conjunction of mm. two different traditions actually. He is, and the, the kind of well. performance tradition and, and a theatrical tradition. Yeah, and, and, and a third which was TV. That sense of 
channel surfing mixed with, I think, the two strands that you're talking yeah. about as well. Is it, I don't know if you know Dance Noise, who we were a um, female duo performing kind of at the same time as Cap Karen Finley, um, and uh, who who just came on stage kind of in in girdles and bras and and kind of screaming and that was just they came on screaming they were throwing things around they were tearing heads off dolls they were throwing buckets of blood on each other it was just this kind of what <laughs> and 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 but they saw themselves as dancers yeah. which was like um, uh, they toured in Britain a lot actually so, yeah. Hmm? Dance noise. Um, can I pick up on something economic, I think, with the connection between um, marriage and military as being connected to neoliberalism? It sort of struck me just now that it actually seems much more connected to a Fordist organization and Protestant work ethic much more than it does um, a kind of well what what we describe capitalism today where where you have this idea of precarity which is much more living in the present and, and you know you wouldn't want to set up a stable family because you don't know where you're going to live or if you're going to have a job or anything like that so well we might say that but I don't think that's people's lived experience that we people yeah. might theorize that as such but um, yeah it's all our, as far as I'm concerned, all I'm still hearing from Cameron at all is, you know, family, family, let's check family, we're making these cuts, but we But I suppose that's the distinction family, between, you know, ideology and, and the sort of what, what the materially, you yeah. know, the materially <laughs> actually contributes to the economy, because then you have the idea of the pink pound, which is, you know, very much that, because um, uh, gays and lesbians do not, or you know, ideologically, do not yeah. have children. Therefore, they have more money to spend. Yeah. And that, that's very much within a kind of neoliberal discourse, mm -hmm. not yeah. not family. So I think we hear all of that, but yeah. much more, it's it is about that kind of precarity. Of, I think Botansky and Chiapello, you should read, were very good on the the way that that you know liberatory yeah. energy was yeah. reconceived into our. Oh, certainly. I mean, um, um, you know, I think. Um, there are a lot of areas in this particular work that I don't feel, you know, I think we just feel right. I'm going to give this. I, I mean, I said in the article quite clearly that I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert on HIV and AIDS and performance either. I'm absolutely mm -hmm. not, and and cannot claim to be. And in the same way, you know, I'm not a political economist either, um, and can only rely on, um, you know, I guess whatever sources I'm looking at that are, mm -hmm. are offering me something. And I certainly, from Duggan particularly, and, um, and a career or two, I think those were the, the sort of um, contextualizing works, particularly the idea of homonormativity from Duggan, um, were very useful. And certainly going back to um, Michael Warner, for instance, and, and those kind of different kind of contexts of um, his books, The Trouble with Normal mm -hmm. and Fear for Fear of like the difference in times in there as well, were useful. But again, I can't make any claim to, you know, it's, it's not my specialism to be, um, uh, to, you know, political economy. Uh, but you're right, I mean, the, the more I read that's relevant to it, absolutely not, I'll get the name from you. Um, but, uh, but again, I sort of wonder at what point, and um, I always have this in my face, at what point do we get to stop? <laughs> you know, is there a point when you can't actually write anything because you can't get so, But that's not to say that that's a really digression, but um, no, I agree. I think there's other ways because I just happen mm. to formulate it this way, mm. you know, um, and I'm not writing it again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's fair enough if you develop a certain approach yeah. to it. I mean, you can't yeah. just include absolutely everything in no. it. I mean, you know, then you yeah. have to kind of acknowledge yeah. that. Yeah. Or else you could go that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.